There's no getting away from the fact that Huntington's is a horrible disease. I want to know if I have children, could I potentially not be there mm. around later on in their life? The research never stops. There's this kind of determination to triumph over it. If not for them, then, you know, for the next generation. Three years ago, I was tested for Huntington's disease, a rare, incurable, hereditary, degenerative disorder of the brain. Anyone with a parent with the gene has a 50-50 chance of inheriting it, and around 8,000 people have it in the UK. I was lucky and my results came back negative, but it was far from the end of my story with Huntington's. Two of my uncles and my mum are still facing the disease, and two of my younger sisters and my cousins are at risk of inheriting it. It is sometimes described as Parkinson's, dementia, and motor neuron disease rolled into one. And once symptomatic, people tend to die between 10 to 20 years later. There's no cure, but Huntington's trials are happening all over the world. To mark Huntington's Disease Awareness Month this May, I've come back to my parents' house to chat to my mum and my sister about their experiences. So, do you want to tell me again about when you first found out about Huntington's and when you first found out that you had Huntington's? It was in the year 2000. I'd noticed my mum um, doing a bit of what I'm doing now, sort of like foot tapping, little bits that I had seen in my nail. And then I went along and had the blood test. Um, and then, yeah, and then I found out that I'd got it, which was a bit of a Shock, shocked to the system. I, I think that's why I ended up studying biology because I just thought that I just wanted to find out about it really. My name is Professor Ed Wild. I'm a neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London and I'm a professor of neurology at the Huntington's Disease Centre at University College London. In um, 2021 obviously the drug that my mum was on and my uncle had been on uh, was stopped. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about kind of what happened there? The people that were in that trial, including members of your family, were the people that we um, had hand chosen as being, you know, the ideal people to be in this really groundbreaking trial. The message that's come out of that trial is that it was a dosing issue, that the dose of drug was too high. So even for that one drug, Tommy Nursen, it's likely that if we can go in with a lower dose, a bit more cautiously, perhaps into brains that are slightly earlier in the disease, that that drug might still be able to produce clinical benefit. And if that happens, it'll be awesome. The question is whether the, whether these drugs can lower Huntington safely and whether they can do it without adversely affecting the production of other proteins. As a scientist, I know that they are making immense strides forward. Mm. Um, and that, you know, even though the mine is being paused at the moment. Huntington's will be cured. Only around 10 to 15 percent of people ever get tested, with most not wanting to find out what their future holds. So, Roisin, you're now about to go through the Huntington's testing process, so the same process I went through. What made you come to that decision? After you found out, the immediate feeling was that. I, wa I wanted to know. Had that first appointment, was waiting for the second, and then, yeah, the pandemic happened. So it was put on hold for a good two or three years. Quite honestly, I don't think I'd be able to do it without <laughs> you guys. It would be so lonely. And I do feel like my heart goes out to people that maybe have a smaller family or don't have anyone around them, because actually I think it is just, so like so important for me a massive part of wanting to find out was i couldn't cope with the kind of flip of the coin 50 50 chance of having the gene um how did you think about that and how did that impact kind of your mental health i want to know if i have children could i potentially not be there hmm. around later on in their life obviously there's so much like hope for the future with all the drug trials and stuff and mum always kind of brought us up telling us that it wouldn't we wouldn't have to worry about because there'd be a cure mm -hmm. in time for our generation yeah. does that and we'll just switch the gene off yeah like the science around it is incredible yeah. i am i am definitely definitely hopeful and it makes it has made my decision to find out um 
much easier because I, I can definitely sense that hope. But I do, for the last couple of years, I, I have found exhausting because it's so hopeful and it's so close, but just not there yet. And I've been doing this for 17 years, which is crazy. Now I'm in the position where I'm starting to see the kids of the people that I uh, first met when I started in 2005. So a lot of the people that I met in 2005 are now very unwell or some of them have died and their kids are now either being tested or starting to become symptomatic. And really that's a huge um, kick up the arse to me. It's a reminder that we, however hard we work and however, however much progress we make, it's not enough. That everyone knows when they sign up that there's a chance that the trial won't turn out the way that we want it to. Most of our volunteers are doing it for other family members, for the next generation. It sounds weird, but it is a gift for me because I just live my life in a certain way and try to be kind and try to bring you all up to be the same, really. Yeah. Like we're, we all are so aware of how precious life is. Whether you test negative or positive, or even decide to get tested at all, this disease places a huge strain on the mental health of the entire family. But the way we as a family have faced this is to admit when we're struggling, to face it together, and to continue to help raise awareness about the research and support families need. Ultimately though, we keep going by having hope that there is a cure on the horizon for the next generation.